I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Hey everybody, it's Chris Bumbray here again for JoeBlow.com with another video edition of the best movie you never saw, and this week we're taking a look at the Joe Dante film, Inner Space. Now, in this one, Dennis Quaid plays a drunken test pilot named Tuck Pendleton who volunteers for a miniaturization experiment where he's supposed to be injected into a rabbit. When the project is hijacked by the henchmen of an evil arms dealer played by Kevin McCarthy, he finds himself injected into a hypochondriac supermarket clerk played by Martin Short who, along with Tuck's ex-girlfriend Lydia played by Meg Ryan, only has 24 hours to recover the microchip that can restore Pendleton before he runs out of oxygen. Now, in addition to Dennis Quaid, Martin Short, Meg Ryan, and Kevin McCarthy, this also co-stars Vernon Wells from Commando, minus his chain link vest but with an artificial hand, Fiona Lewis, and Robert Picardo. It's written by the late Jeffrey Bohm, who wrote Lethal Weapon 2 and The Lost Boys, as well as Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. The music's by the great Jerry Goldsmith, and of course it's directed by Joe Dante, with it being his follow-up to Gremlins and Explorers. Now, I have to say, I've always really liked Joe Dante's movies, especially the ones from his 1980s heyday. Inner Space, to me, is an absolutely beloved childhood classic, probably as much so as something like Gremlins. It's an Amblin Entertainment production, meaning Steven Spielberg had his hands all over it, and it was one of Warner Brothers' big movies for the summer of 1987, and apparently test screenings for this one were absolutely off the charts, making everyone think this was going to be a giant blockbuster. It also didn't hurt that the three stars at the time all seemed on the brink of major stardom. Dennis Quaid had been kicking around for a long time, but was just coming off the Big Easy and the right stuff. Many thought he was going to become the next Harrison Ford. Martin Short also was coming off of SCTV and Saturday Night Live and had the hit Three Amigos under his belt while Meg Ryan had just been in Top Gun. Butter. Take me to bed or lose me forever. Show me the way home, buddy. Strangely, when Inner Space hit theaters, it landed with a bit of a thud. On its opening weekend, it was actually beaten by Dragnet and Spaceballs, both of which were playing on fewer screens and were in their second weekend. If you look at articles from the era, they seem to suggest that Warner Brothers, the studio that put out the film, made a big mistake marketing the special effects and the Spielberg connection, because this is the same time another Amblin Entertainment movie called Harry and the Hendersons came out and was also a giant flop. Instead of emphasizing the likable stars, if you look at the original poster for Inner Space, it's two fingers holding the little ship that Tuck Pendleton pilots inside of Martin Short. It looks cool, but... You know, what does it really tell people about the movie? Sure enough, a revamped ad campaign which emphasized the stars with a new poster that's actually the cover art for the DVD and for the VHS cover, and good word of mouth helped the movie eke out a $25 million gross. Not quite covering the budget, but luckily, home video business was brisk. Joe Dante explains it best himself. It's odd because, you know, in 1987, they weren't talking about inner space. It came out and it didn't make any money. The trajectory of fame on that movie and a lot of other movies made by directors in the 80s was that even though they weren't successful theatrically, they were big hits on home video. And cassettes being passed from one household to another eventually led to some of these movies that were pretty much considered flops becoming very beloved. In the minds of many people today, they assume that they were big hits theatrically because they're so well known today. One thing that's kind of interesting about the VHS release of Inner Space, it came out when I was about maybe six years old, and I remember at the beginning they had this little featurette which was basically explaining why the movie was going to be presented in the letterbox format, which at the time was I think 166 to 1, not quite a full 185 to 1, so not really the aspect ratio the movie was shot in, but something that would be a little bit less compromising than pan and scan. At the time, I had no idea what any of these terms meant, and I actually thought that the bottom and tops of the screen were being cut off, kind of annoyed me. It took me years before I was sophisticated enough to realize what Letterbox actually was, although I have to say, even though I got really into Letterbox movies, it was tough going at the time because I grew up with a 20-inch TV in my basement, not quite like the huge screens that we have now. Suffice to say though, lots of people picked this up on VHS, and in the years since, Inner Space has really managed a small cult following. I still think it's a little too obscure given how well-crafted a sci-fi comedy adventure it is. Now, Joe Dante described Inner Space like this. What would happen if Dean Martin was shrunk and stuck inside of Jerry Lewis's body? Now, this may not mean much to you millennials out there, but Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, of course, were a famous comedy team in the 50s. Dean Martin went on to huge success as a rat packer, the epitome of cool and sophistication, while Jerry Lewis was, well, Jerry Lewis, the nighty professor. At the time, this was considered high concept. So what if a cool guy, basically a box office leading man, in this case Dennis Quaid, was injected into the body of a movie comedian, somebody like Martin Short? This is what they called high concept. 
High concept was a term that dominated the 80s. Basically, you'd have a very easy hook to sell the movie on, which would make people want to see it. At the time, they weren't really doing established properties like they do now. Nowadays, you could base it on a really popular book, a superhero movie, some kind of franchise character. They don't really need to be high concept. At the time, though, concept was king. So here's a couple of high concepts for you. Smart Mouth X-Con Alcoholic Cop Team Up. 48 hours. I want to know what the fuck this is all about. I gave you 48 hours to come up with something and the clock's running. Suicidal cop on the edge and family man cop team up to take on drug dealers. Lethal weapon. Yeah, under the chin. Yeah, 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 yeah under the chin. <laughs> Rich white guy, poor black guy, trade places. Becomes trading places. You're a dead man, Valentine! Dead cop teams up with living cop. Dead heat. Roger, Roger, but you can't get him if you're dead, man. Well, hmm, maybe that high concept didn't work out quite well enough. Don Simpson's biography was actually called High Concept because he was arguably the king of this. I mean, think of it this way. Wise cracking cop from Detroit goes to Beverly Hills. Beverly Hills cop. Sexy welder by day strips at night. Flash dance. High Concept, people. And indeed, inner space is about as high concept as they come. It's a lot like the movie Fantastic Voyage, where a team of scientists were shrunk down and injected into a critically ill patient to perform emergency surgery. Here, the team is reduced to just one man, a roguish Han Solo type, and it's given a spy movie twist with short or unlikely hero who has to prevent the secret of miniaturization from getting into the hands of the baddies. Sure enough, Inner Space is the kind of movie they just don't make anymore. Joe Dante explains it by saying, well, Inner Space, it's an Amla picture, which means it's a Spielberg movie, which puts it in a higher rung of movies. It's not a B picture, it's an A picture, but those kind of movies were sort of a trend in the 80s. They were making family-oriented comedy special effects movies. That's kind of gone by the wayside because with the rise of CGI and the ability to show people flying around and doing things that were very difficult to present years ago, the movies have become a spectacle business. It's all about how many cities you can destroy and how many planets you can blow up. Indeed, those aren't the kind of movies that Joe Dante make, and the kind of movies that he made, in fact, aren't really made anymore, which kind of explains why he hasn't done that many movies in the last couple of years. It's too bad because he was really a pro at this kind of big-budget family adventure movie. Running exactly two hours, Inner Space is a non-stop action-filled fast-paced romp that manages to mix in a lot of genres without doing any of them in a half-assed way. I mean, it's a straightforward comedy with Martin Short giving the performance of his life as the Walter Mitty-ish hero, but it's also a good thriller jam-packed with hair-raising chases and terrific stunt work. There's one scene that's really cool, Martin Short is trying to get inside of Meg Ryan's convertible, which is speeding up after the truck that he's imprisoned in, where he kinda has to stand on her dash. It's pretty exciting stuff. I have to say, Joe Dante was really on a roll in 1987, coming off of Gremlins and Explorers, and he'd followed up with The Burbs and the surprisingly experimental and atypical Gremlins 2 The New Batch, a movie that I have to say I really hated as a kid but kinda love now, and then of course there was Matinee and a few other good movies before he slowed his output. In his time, Dante was a master of this kind of movie, and it makes me wish someone would give him the kind of resources he had back in the day to do another fun action comedy adventure, a genre he seems unusually proficient in. It helps, though, that Inner Space is absolutely impeccably cast. Dennis Quaid seems to be having the time of his life as Tuck Pendleton, with him stuck inside of short for most of the running time. In fact, if you only know Dennis Quaid from kind of the movies that he does nowadays, you'll be surprised at how much fun he's having here. It's like he's playing a Han Solo type character, and I've rarely seen Quaid be so loose. That said, even though he looks like your typical A-list leading man, it's Short that actually dominates the film, and he never really got his due as a top comedy star. He's very effective here, able to be wacky, but also occasionally heroic. I really don't think it's the kind of movie that a lot of comedy stars could actually pull off, and I'm having a hard time to think of any that could do it in the way that Short did. Of them all though, I have to say the one that really broke out in inner space was Meg Ryan, who also fell in love with Dennis Quaid during filming, with the two of them re-teaming on DOA a couple years later and getting married. Well, Meg Ryan had been around for a long time at this point. Inner Space was the first time she was really the classic Meg Ryan character, and she's adorably sexy throughout and a considerable heroine in her own right, as a plucky reporter slash love interest. And I have to say, she would have made such a good Lois Lane at this point. The baddies are also really great, with Dante fave Kevin McCarthy, who you will all recognize from either Invasion of the Body Snatchers or, of course, one of his later era movies where he's the bad guy in the Weird Al Yankovic classic UHF. You're fired! He's kind of a John Huston-like character. He wears this white suit and kind of rambles on. I love his voice. He has this really cool face. Kevin McCarthy, to me, was always one of those A-list kind of character actors. I also really like Fiona Lewis as his sexy henchwoman, and the road warrior commandos Vernon Wells as the one-armed baddie, although there's this one joke involving a vibrator that went way over my head as a kid, and I'm shocked ended up in the movie. I'm so tired of being alone. I'm so tired. 
that said, I think of all the supporting performers in the movie, the one who really gets the most out of it is Robert Picardo. Robert Picardo was something of a Joe Dante mainstay at this point. I mean, he had been in Explorers, he had been in The Howling, and this was a couple of years before he played the holographic doctor on Star Trek Voyager. He plays this Russian arms dealer bad guy named the Cowboy, but thanks to a plot twist, Picardo actually gets to briefly be the leading man when Dennis Quaid manipulates Short's features so that he can imitate him. So Picardo basically is playing Martin Short playing the cowboy and it's really cool he does the voice work himself it's not Martin Short looping him and he does this thing where he has to speak like the cowboy with a Russian accent but with Martin Short doing a Russian accent so it's a really cool imitation job and Rob Bucardo is great in this movie I have to say I had it done uh, Clint Eastwood style <laughs> you'll see outlaw Yossi Vales <laughs> what a flick if you ever want to know what it would be like to have Robert Picardo as a leading man, you kind of get a glimpse of it in Inner Space. Now, if you want to see Inner Space, pretty easy to find. You could find it on iTunes, you could find it on Blu-ray, and of course, it's also available on DVD. And I have to say, Inner Space to me really is a lost classic from the 80s. It's got that great Jerry Goldsmith score, special effects that won an Oscar for ILM, and I think really hold up, and great performances all around. I have to say, this one comes highly recommended. It's the kind of movie that Hollywood just doesn't make anymore, and that's original, non-sequel, big-budget tentpole, and I really wish they still did this kind of thing. Inner Space is a great movie to check out. I absolutely loved it, and I loved revisiting it. Until next time, I'm Chris Bumbray for JoeBlow.com.